Now let me talk about the economy and why there is a lot of anger and frustration among the American people. And in a nutshell, this is what's going on. What is going on is that the great middle class of this country, once the envy of the entire world, is in fact disappearing. And that has been going on for the last 40 years. Today, median family income, that family right in the middle of the American economy, today has earns $5,000 less than it did in 1999. Now, all over this country, you all know we have an increase in productivity, we have an increase in technology, and yet median family income has gone down. Today, that median male worker, that man in the middle of the economy, in inflation accounted for wages, made $783 less last year than he did 41 years ago. You got a global economy, you got technology, you got an increase in productivity, and that guy right in the middle of the American economy is making close to $800 less than he did 41 years ago. That typical woman worker right in the middle of the economy is making $1,300 less than she did eight years ago. What we have seen is an increase in poverty in America. We have more people living in poverty than at almost any time in American history. We are seeing in my state people not working one job, but working two jobs, working three jobs. We're seeing most of the new jobs being created are low-wage, part-time jobs. But while the middle class is in decline, while we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major nation on earth, there is another reality that is going on in America. And that is that the people on top and the largest corporations have never had it so good. And what we are looking at right now is America having the most unequal distribution of wealth and income of any major country on earth. And it is worse in our country today than at any time since 1929, before the Great Depression. In terms of distribution of wealth, what we have after we work our entire lives, you have the top one-tenth of one percent owning more wealth than the bottom 90 percent. Do you think that's what America is supposed to be about? One-tenth of one percent owning more wealth than the bottom 90 percent. You have one family, the Walton family that owns Walmart, owning more wealth than the bottom 40% of American people. You have today, in terms of income, top 1% earning more income than the bottom 50%. And listen to this. Since the Wall Street crash, 99% of all new income generated in America went to the top 1%. In other words, you have an economic situation today where it is very clear. The situation is stacked against working people. They're working longer hours for low wages. I'll tell you a story that some of you already know. When I was a young person, a long time ago to be sure, but when I was young, you know what the expectation in America was? The expectation was that one person in a household, often the men in those days, could work 40 hours a week and earn enough living to take care of the whole family. How many families do you know where one person is earning enough money to pay the bills for the whole family? Very few. So you got husbands working long hours, you got wives working long hours, you have kids working. I talked, I was up at the university the other day, you have kids who are working part-time working part-time in order to pay for school so they can't even focus on their earnings. So we're looking at massive income and wealth inequality, which has a moral component, an economic component, and a political component. The moral component is how do we feel in this nation, once seen around the world as the nation of opportunity, 
when so few have so much and so many have so little? How do we feel in recent years seeing a proliferation of millionaires and billionaires at the same time as we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country on earth? You got millions of kids going to school who are literally hungry. And you got others sleeping out on the streets. How do we feel about that from a moral perspective? From an economic perspective, here's the problem. My Republican colleagues tell us that the job creators are the CEOs of large corporations. And let me respectfully disagree. You know who the job creators are? The job creators in this country are the working men and women who spend the money buying goods and buying services which create the jobs. It is economics 101 to know that no matter how smart a business person may be, he or she can't sell a product if people don't have the money to buy that product. Yeah. And if we want to create good paying jobs, that our economic program is to make sure that the vast majority of the people, the working families and the middle class of this country have the income they need to live with dignity, to take care of their families, to spend money so that we can create the jobs that we need. Now, from an economic point of view, what we're looking at is from 1985 to 2013, the share of the nation's wealth going to the middle class has gone down from 36% to less than 23%. If the middle class had simply maintained the same share of our nation's wealth as it had 30 years ago, it would have over $10 trillion more in cumulative wealth than it does today. Meanwhile, at the same time, the share of the nation's wealth going to the top one-tenth of one percent has gone up from 10% in 1985 to 22% in 2013. So what the economy has been about is the Robin Hood principle in reverse. We have taken from the poor and working families and we've given to the rich. And that is wrong and that is bad economics. And then, as I mentioned a moment ago, it's not only an issue of morality or an issue of economics, it is an issue of democracy and politics, because what the billionaire class is doing with their money is now in the process of buying elections. So this issue of income and wealth inequality is a huge and profound issue that must be dealt with. Let me touch on some of the other issues that we are also seeing. And then I want to talk to you about what I think we can do to improve the situation. It's easy enough to describe the problems. It is harder to talk about the solutions. Today in this country, and I was just at the University of Iowa yesterday and Drake University as well, talking to a lot of young people. And what the young people here say is exactly what they say in the state of Vermont and all over this country. Now just think about this. We live in a highly competitive global economy where most of the good jobs, not all, but most of the good jobs require a higher education of one form or another. And you know what we are saying to the young people of this country? We are saying that if you are low income or moderate income, you better think twice about whether or not you're gonna to go to college. And I have talked to young people, and I think many of you have talked to young people and said, you know what? It's an unstable economy. It's a volatile economy. I don't know if I want to go to college and leave school $50,000 in debt. And I'm not going to go to college. And then other people do go to college and they come out deeply in debt. A few months ago, I talked to a woman in Burlington, Vermont. Her crime was that she wanted to be a primary care physician, something we desperately need. And in fact, she went to college, she went to medical school, and that is exactly what she's doing now, working with low-income people in a community health center in Burlington. She came out of school $300,000 in debt, 
talk to dentists, and we desperately need dentists, $250,000 in debt. I got lawyers in my own office in Washington, $100,000 in debt. Meanwhile, around the rest of the world, in Germany, Scandinavia, and other countries, you know what they're saying? They're saying to the young people, we want you to get an education. We need you to get an education if we're going to be competitive. Therefore, in those countries, they have free college education, and I think it's time we learn something from them. President Obama came up with what I thought was a good idea, two years free of community college, but I think we have got to go further. Some of you may remember, you may remember, again, and it's important especially for the young people to understand this, 40 or 50 years ago in this country, some of the great public universities, not only of America, but of the world, University of California, City University of New York, do you know what tuition was 40 or 50 years ago? Who knows? 121 is zero. It was zero. So how does it happen that with all of the new technology and all of the global economy and all of the productivity, we go from zero tuition in our great public universities to unaffordability in our great public universities? So I think what we say to the young people, we say to them when they're in the fourth grade and the fifth grade, if you study hard and if you're serious and if you're a good student, Regardless of the income of your family, you are going to get all of the education that you need. That's what I think we say. Today. Now, some people may say, well, that's a radical idea. Well, how are we going to afford it? Let me give you an example. And I am the ranking member on the budget committee. All right? Right now, we'll talk about this in a moment, our Republican colleagues think that we are not spending enough money on the military. They want us to spend a lot more. And some of us think, some of them think, and I have to say this, that we have not been at war in the Middle East long enough. <laughs> that we should bring our troops back on the ground in the Middle East. Now, the Republicans want to spend a whole lot of money. The president also wants to spend more money, not as much as the Republicans. So the president is proposing is a $36 billion increase in military spending, a $36 billion increase in non-military spending for really important programs. Republicans want to spend more on the military, and they want to cut programs for working families. But even if you look at the president's proposal, if you do just this thing, and I would go a lot further, he wants to spend $36 billion more for the military. You cut that in half. You take $18 billion dollars. You say to the state of Iowa and the state of Vermont, states all over this country, if you match that $18 billion, and we're going to put that money into public colleges and universities, do you know what you could do? You could do away with all tuition, all tuition, in every public college and university in America, and I think that makes a lot more sense to me than spending more money on the military. Now, when you go out and you ask the American people what is the issue uppermost on their mind, every single poll says the same thing. They say jobs and the economy. Now, why is that? Because when you see in the papers that official unemployment is 5.8%, I trust that you all understand that that is different than real unemployment. All right? Real unemployment, government figures, include those people who have given up looking for work and those people who are working part-time when they want to work full-time. If you add those numbers together, what the government statistics tell you is that real unemployment in America is over 11%. Youth unemployment, which we never talk about, is 18%. African-American youth unemployment, close to 30%. So what do we need to do? We need to create millions of decent paying jobs. That's what we need to do. And I remember your former Senator Tom Harkin, very good friend of mine, talked about what the CCC, the Conservation Corps under Roosevelt, Civilian Conservation Corps, did for his own dad. I don't know if you ever heard Tom talk about that story. All right? And that is what we have to do today. Now, how do you do that? What we do is rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. Yeah. 
in my state and in your state. We have roads and bridges we have, that are disintegrating. We have a rail system and airports way behind other countries around the world. We need work on levees and dams. We need an enormous amount of work to be done to make our country more efficient, more productive, and safer. I've recently introduced legislation that for over a five-year period would put a trillion dollars into rebuilding our infrastructure, and you know what that would do? That would create 13 million decent-paying jobs, and that, in my view, is exactly what we should be doing. Now, I know if some of you turn on the wrong channel and get to Fox by mistake, <laughs> you will believe or hear that there is a debate about climate change. <laughs> there is no debate. I sit on the Environmental Committee and the Energy Committee, and I can tell you that we have heard from scientists throughout our country and the world who say climate change is real, Climate change is caused by carbon emissions and human activity. Climate change is already causing devastating problems. And if we do not get our act together and transform our energy system, these problems will only become much more severe in terms of droughts and floods, extreme weather disturbances, rising sea levels. In my view, we have got to lead the world in transforming our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. And when we talk about the economy, it's not just creating jobs. It is making sure that those people who are working are earning a decent wage. In Washington now, and Tom Harkin helped lead this effort, there is a bill that would raise the starvation minimum wage in Washington of seven and a quarter to 10, 10 an hour. I think that's a good start, but we should go further than that. Anybody in America, in my view, who works 40 hours a week should not be living in poverty, period. We need pay equity for women workers. Some of the women here seem to agree with that. It is hard to defend a woman making 78 cents on the dollar compared to a man doing the same work. That's indefensible. We've got to end that. We have to deal with the scandal of overtime in America. Many people think, incorrectly, that if you're working 50 hours a week, you get 10 hours of time and a half. That is not true for the vast majority of workers. What happened is that we're operating under very old fair labor standards which need to be changed. Right now, you could work at McDonald's, make $25,000 a year, and be a quote-unquote supervisor yeah. of two other workers. You work 50 hours a week, you don't get any overtime. We have to radically change that. If you work more than 40 hours a week, let's make sure workers get overtime paid. Now there's another issue that is not a sexy issue, but it is an enormously important issue. And it's an issue that as a nation we discuss far too rarely. And that is we have got to make a determination of whether or not the trade policies that have been adopted in this country for the last 30 or 40 years make any sense at all. You are looking at somebody who when he was in the House and now in the Senate, has voted against NAFTA, Yay. voted against CAFTA, Yay. voted against permanent normal trade relations with China, and is damn well going to vote against the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade. Now, I happen to think that trade is a good thing when it is done well. But these trade agreements have been written and pushed by the big multinational corporations. And what they have basically attempted successfully to do is to say to American workers, your competition is in China, it's in Vietnam, it's in Mexico, it's in low-wage countries where people are working for pennies an hour, where they can't form a union, where there are very few, if any, environmental rules. 
Free trade does not mean to me that an American worker has to compete against a worker in Vietnam where the minimum wage is 56 cents an hour. What we have got to demand from corporate America is that every night on TV they're advertising and they're telling us, buy this product, buy that product. What we have got to tell them is that if they want us to buy their products, the time is long overdue for them to start building those products here in the United States of America and not in China. When we talk about the economy, it would be irresponsible not to deal with what goes on in Wall Street. And I think as most of you know, the terrible, terrible recession which we are trying desperately to crawl out of and have made some success over the last six years was caused by the greed and the recklessness and the illegal behavior on Wall Street. Now if a kid smokes marijuana or somebody breaks a window someplace, that kid could end up getting arrested. But it always seems to me rather amazing that the CEOs of Wall Street firms whose recklessness and illegal behavior resulted in millions of people losing their jobs, their homes, and their life savings, that not one of these guys has ended up in jail for their illegal behavior. And the issue there is not whether the banks are too big to fail, it's whether the bankers, in some cases, are too big to jail. And there is an argument. No, there's an argument. I mean, whether or not the criminal justice system can, in fact, deal with people this wealthy and this powerful. Now, right now, the six largest financial institutions in this country have assets equivalent to about 60% of the GDP of the United States of America. That is, roughly speaking, about $10 trillion. Six financial institutions. They issue half of the mortgages and about two-thirds of the credit cards in this country. I happen to think that if Teddy Roosevelt were alive today, what he would say, it's time to break them up. And that's what I believe we should do. Some of you know that the United States of America is the only major country on earth that does not guarantee health care to all people as a right. We are the only one. I live 100 miles away from the Canadian border. All of their people have health care as a right. In the UK, you have a health care system different than Canada's. Germany is different than the UK's. Scandinavia is different than Germany. They're all different. But all of them have two or three major components. Number one, health care is a right. And they understand that whether you are able to get health care when you're sick should not be dependent on your income. It's a right as a human being. Yeah. Number two, they also understand, without exception, that the role of private health insurance companies is not to provide quality, affordable health care. It's to make as much money as they possibly can. Yeah. And no other major country on earth. They're all different. All these systems are different. Some are socialized, some are single payer, but there's no other country on earth that allows private health insurance companies to determine the nature of a health care system. In my very strong opinion, the United States of America should move toward a Medicare for all single payer health care system. When we talk about income and wealth inequality, it's also important to understand that at a time when the wealthiest people and largest corporations are doing phenomenally well, there are huge loopholes in the tax system which make it possible for them to avoid their fair share of taxes. Right now, trillions of dollars of corporate profits go to countries like the Cayman Islands and Bermuda and Luxembourg where these corporations pay nothing in taxes. If, and the result of that is that we are losing about $100 billion every single year 
in terms of revenue that should be coming in to our treasury. In addition to that, in terms of individual taxes, you have situations where hedge fund managers pay a lower effective tax rate. And Warren Buffett makes this point all the time. He says he pays a lower effective tax rate than his secretary because of a variety of tax loopholes. I believe that if we are going to rebuild our infrastructure, if we're going to make college affordable for our young people, if we're going to protect the most vulnerable people in this country, large corporations and the wealthiest people have got to understand they are part of America and they're going to have to start paying their fair share of taxes. <laughs>